My approach has often been to sort of uh, have a dialectic, uh, uh, if you were, if you like, between uh, the sort of studies of urbanization and uneven geographical development on the one hand and the kind of understanding of the theory on the other hand. And my tendency is to say if the theory doesn't uh, help me understand any of that, then maybe that's a piece of theory that's not really worth it. Uh, on the other hand, I've been remarkably surprised at how much uh, of Marx has been incredibly uh, useful uh, and helpful uh, in arriving uh, at uh, the interpretations of uh, those phenomena. So there's been a long journey on this with also trying to publish things that showed that coming from a Marxist perspective, you can have things to say about uh, imperialism or neoliberalism or and you know, what's going on in cities and urbanization. So that has been uh, one, one part of what I, what I do. And I thought I'd like to use this opportunity to share um, a few of the insights that uh, I've had um, uh, over the years. Uh, but coupled also with uh, something that I started to do about 18 months ago, and I, I think actually I have a hard time explaining to myself why I did it, apart from the fact that it seemed that since the whole world had gone insane, I might just as well sort of go off and do my own little insane project and not, you know, because it didn't seem like I could do anything about some of the insane things that were going on and are still going on uh, so on a day by day basis, not only in this country, but pretty much everywhere. Um, and so I, I thought I'd take a good hard look at uh, Marx's value theory. Uh, and this came about a bit by accident. I was at the uh, Birkbeck Symposium on Critical Theory and uh, I was on a panel with uh, Zizek of all people and I said something about, you know, well, you know it's maybe it's time we looked at uh, value theory again and he said, yes, you should do it, why aren't you doing it? <laughs> so the next, of, course, of course by now he, he would have written three books about it. And, uh, <laughs> And I was with him again about a couple of months ago, and he says, where, where, where is this stuff on the value theory? And I said, well, you know, I mean, I don't write as fast as you, you know I mean? <laughs> so, so um, but I got into it, and it seemed to me kind of a, a very stupid thing to do, and you feel, you know, the world's collapsing all around you, and there you are wrestling with some kind of obscure kind of piece of Marxist thinking, and it seemed to me I was being very, very stupid, and I felt quite idiotic with myself. But as often happens in these things, things started to come out of it, and after a bit, some new insights came out of it. And, and so part of what I'm, I'm doing right now is, is, is sort of emerging from that into a, a more general uh, sense of uh, understanding. Um, and then I, I thought uh, I'd, I'd write about uh, the value theory, and, and as often happens in these things, it got longer and longer and longer. And, uh, I was with my publisher friend in, in Oxford in the summer and he looked at me and he said, you know, you should just write something that's, you know, kind of simple about ideas, about that surround what it is you're, you're, you're doing and, and you know how to do that, so why don't you do it? So I, since then I've been doing that and what's going on right now is very much a product of, uh, of doing uh, exactly that. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, weirdly, it turns out that uh, September of 2017 is the 150th anniversary of the publication of Volume 1 of Marx's Capital. And suddenly being deluged with all these invitations, we've got to do something to, uh, to, to commemorate all of this. So I thought, well, you know, maybe I should get ahead of the game and start commemorating it a year before uh, and at least prepare the way. And I hope that uh, next, uh, uh, next September we can uh, actually, uh, you know, get together some conversations about uh, uh, the, the significance of uh, that publication. Uh, I may, of course, in the, in the process of, of these talks, uh, preempt uh, much of which what I really <coughs> want to say. So this, uh, this uh, week uh, I want to look at the, the question of Marx's concept of uh, capital. 
And the one I favour, uh, and I think Marx favours, is to define it as value in motion. Um, what this then requires is that uh, I talk a little bit about um, both what we mean by value and what is the motion. Uh, Marx himself, uh, of course, uh, in doing his critique of classical political economy, hoped to come up with uh, some idea of what the laws of motion of capital would look like. Uh, but if you're going to talk about the laws of motion, then uh, the definition of capital as being about uh, motion is, I think, uh, uh, a very obvious uh, connection. So, value. Uh, now, value is a, a, a very complicated idea in Marx, uh, and therefore it's not something that I'm going to actually try to unravel uh, at this point, but I do have to start somewhere. Uh, and the definition I start with is value for Marx is the social labor we do for others as mediated through commodity production uh, through price fixing markets. Now that's a bit of a mouthful of a definition, but I think it, what it signals is that the exchange that goes on. Uh, between participants in the market economy is an exchange based upon the labor time they have utilized in the production of whatever commodity that they are taking to market. And what Marx does is to say, if you were in a barter situation, uh, in effect there would be as many measures of value as there are commodities to exchange. That in effect if you produce shirts and I'm producing shoes, uh, I would measure the value of my shoes in terms of your shirts and you would do the same thing the other way around. And therefore there would be a cacophony of value all over the place uh, in, a, uh, in a barter situation, in multiple barters. But then Marx says, you know, I'm really interested in how value evolves in a situation where exchange becomes normalized as a social act. And the only way you can set up a myriad exchanges between all sorts of different commodities and millions of people producing thousands if not millions of commodities uh, is to have one commodity which actually becomes the measure of value in that commodity is of course the money commodity. So what Marx does is to suggest that the rise of the money commodity parallels the transformation of all those multiple values into a single notion of value so that as commodity exchange becomes more and more generalized and, and more and more universal so a universal notion of value starts to crystallize out alongside of it. So, uh, now this relationship between value and money is, I think, a very important one. It's a, and it's one that is often forgotten uh, in what follows, because value for Marx is a social relation, and social relations are immaterial. Take something like power. I mean, how do you actually? find the atoms or you know, molecules of power. You can't do it. Uh, and nevertheless, you wouldn't say, well, because you can't find the molecules of it, it doesn't exist. You kind of say, no, this is uh, important, uh, but it's immaterial. And Marx actually defines value as a social relation which is immaterial but objective. And the parallel he uses is, is gravity. And when she says, you know, you can dissect a stone as much as you like, but you can't find atoms of gravity in the stone. The stone, the stone has a relationship with other stones, and gravity is that relation. And the same thing applies uh, to commodities. You can't dissect a commodity and find atoms of value inside of it. You can't break it open and say, ah, oh, here they are. You can only find out what the value is through its relation with other commodities and eventually with the money. So it's immaterial but objective, as he calls it. The objective side of it is taken care of by the money, so the money is a very firm material representation of the social relation. And the material representation of that social relation is something that is, uh, I think, again, very, going to be very significant throughout Marx's work. Uh, 
because the material what Marx calls money, the material asset, uh, he says, is not value, and money is, is actually an expression or a representation of value. And that therefore you always have to bear in mind that representations of something like value are maybe accurate in certain dimensions but nearly always misrepresent in others. Um, I tend to use geographical examples because I come from a geographical background. It's a bit like map projections. You know, there are all these different map projections, you know. You can't say, well, actually there's only one globe. Um, you know, but the representation of the globe often misleads at the same time as it represents. And we're going to have that same problem with money, and that's a crucial issue to discuss contemporarily, because what's happening to money vis-a-vis -vis value is that they have got, you know, it's a complicated relation between the, represent, the thing that represents money that represents value and that which it's supposed to represent. And, and that therefore money can lie, money can betray. Uh, and, and so I think that this relationship is therefore foundational uh, for Marx. And it's a very interesting to me that you know, in a lot of Marx's work, people start talking about values and then suddenly they start talking about money as if there's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that relationship. But in fact, there's a lot that can go wrong in that relationship. Uh, and they have quite completely different qualities. And one of the key qualities is that you can't appropriate value because it's immaterial. You can't bottle it and keep it in a corner or stick it under the mattress or something like that. But you can do that with money. So actually what Marx talks about is the capacity of money uh, to actually concentrate uh, a certain kind of form of social power which is appropriable by private persons. And in fact, the whole kind of notion of class and individual and all the rest of it rests on the fact that social power can be appropriated by private persons. And you can't appropriate it directly, you can only appropriate its representation. So when people are chasing money, they're chasing the representation. And the question is, when they're chasing the representation, what's the relationship between the representation and that which it's seeking to represent? So this is something that is foundational uh, for, for Marx. So value, then, is that social relation. But it's a social relation that's in motion. And what does it mean to say it's in motion? Uh, now Marx uh, actually has, a, I think, a very interesting way of setting this up. And I want to describe that. And I'm again, first, however, want to uh, use uh, one example of, of this, uh, which uh, comes from somewhere completely different. Uh, that is an analogy. Now Marx actually liked to have analogies. He was always using them. He, was doing analogies with Darwin and evolution and uh, crystallography and all the rest of it. But the, uh, uh, the thing that suddenly struck me was uh, why couldn't we come up with, uh, as it were, a visualization of what Marx is talking about when he's talking about the value in motion. And this I, was, I did by using this following analogy. All right, well, uh, this is uh, the hydrological cycle. And the thing I like about the hydrological cycle is that, you know, HTO is moving around. It's in the ocean. Uh, it evaporates. It then becomes, it takes on its gaseous form, and then it condenses. And it goes through different transformations. It goes through what Marx calls metamorphoses as it moves. It now has this form. It then takes another form. Uh, and it then moves at different paces and different ways, and the way it moves uh, also leads sometimes for the water to be stored in various ways, in glaciers and ice caps, and it also gets stored underground in water, and you get these flows and you get evaporation going on. So the movement of the HTO is actually something that is visualized in this way of the hydrological cycle. 
And there was a great little book by a geographer, which was written about sort of 18th century thinking, which is called The Hydrological Cycle and the Wisdom of God, which was about the way in which uh, people started to recognize that uh, there was something called the hydrological cycle and that you could actually represent it uh, in, this, in this kind of way. So this to me then was, was a, it seemed to me a very interesting way because it is a cycle and it keeps on going in perpetuity. Uh, it is a cycle, however, that has certain characteristics. One is that the main energy for the cycle comes from input of energy from the sun, solar energy. Uh, that is, over time, is fairly constant, except that with the depletion of greenhouse gases, more energy is coming in, and therefore the cycle is beginning to get pushed a bit harder because there's more energy uh, coming down onto planet Earth through global warming and all the rest of it. So you're seeing certain things of that sort beginning, beginning to happen. But by and large, that it, it is a cycle. Uh, and I'm going to actually make a big differentiation here between the cycle, uh, the hydrological cycle, which is a useful sort of tool for thinking about uh, how H2O moves around and how capital moves around. And the movement of capital, however, uh, is different because it's going, in, going to end up being a spiral form. And there's a big difference between a circle and a spiral. And in English we have this expression, things spiral out of control. And I think spiraling always has connected to it this fear uh, that the whole thing is going to lose control. Whereas the cycle goes round and round and round and you don't lose control. This is what uh, Hegel referred to as the difference between uh, bad infinity and a uh, just uh, infinity. But the circle goes round and round and round, the spiral goes, whoa, you know. So, what about, how do we represent this uh, in capital? Uh, well, I sort of came up with a map of it, and my good friend Miguel has done a wonderful little diagram of it. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me just describe it uh, no, no, quite, no, quite, quite simply, which is that let's start the process off with money. And the first thing to remark is this, that not all money is capital. Uh, capital is money used in a certain kind of way. Which means that the circulation of capital can only begin when there's already money in existence. So there has to be a monetized economy already existing before capital can begin. And what happens with capital beginning is that it takes part of that money and starts to use it in a very specific way. What is the specific way in which it uses it? It takes the money and it goes into commodity markets and it buys commodities. And there are two kinds of commodities it buys. One is labor power and the other is means of production. Now that also means that capital can only work if there is already a labor market, a functioning labor market. And it cannot work unless there's already a functioning commodity market. So the capitalist goes and says, all right, there's workers out there who are exchanging their labor for a wage. I can hire them. There are commodities out there I can buy in terms of, you know, energy inputs and cotton or whatever. And I can, you know, buy all of them. I'll take free goods if, if, if I want, if, if they're there. But Basically, I buy those commodities and I, I then say, all right, with a given technology, I can put the labor together with the means of production and I can make a new commodity. That new commodity is then congealed labor time. That is, labor time has been embodied in that commodity. What Marx calls socially necessary labor time has been embodied in it. That is, it's not simply any old labor time, it is that labor time which is socially necessary, which Marx talks about as being the average labor, labor time, 
which would be required to produce a moderate commodity of that kind. So this commodity is then taken for, out into the marketplace and it is sold for money. Now, notice what has happened here. You started with money, you bought commodities, you then went into production, you then got commodities, and you then sold it for money. Okay. Why would somebody who starts with a given amount of money end up with the same amount of money at the end of that process, having gone through all that aggravation? The answer is there's no incentive or motivation to actually do that, unless you get more money at the end than you started out with at the beginning. Therefore, profit-seeking becomes absolutely crucial and critical for this form of circulation. So that's the first part of the motion. But let's go back into that moment of production. What is being produced at this moment of production? Two things are being produced. One is a material commodity. But the second thing that's being produced is value. That is that immaterial. So there's a material form, which is the commodity, and the immaterial social relation, which is congealed within the commodity. But if you're going to end up with more at the end of the day than you started out with, you've not only got to produce value, you've got to produce surplus value. That there, is, there has to be more value created during the production process. So there's a double process that goes on, a material process of producing commodity and a social process producing value and surplus value. How do you produce surplus value? Well, Marx says this. Okay, when I entered, when the capitalist entered into this marketplace where there's wage laborers, the wage laborers had a value. What is the value of the wage labor? The value of the wage labor, says Marx, uh, is equivalent to the value of the commodities needed to reproduce the value of labor power. So it will be the value of the bread and the shirts and that which will be needed to produce, reproduce labor power at a given standard of living. And now it's going to vary from one place to another and over time, but we know roughly what it is. And Marx then kind of says, you contract with the labourer to work for, say, 10 hours a day. And you then try to see to it that the labourer produces the equivalent of their value power in six hours or whatever. The rest of the hours are free to produce the surplus value for the capitalist. So this is the theory of surplus value. So production is not simply the production of things, it's also the production of surplus value. Okay, so that's the first part of the argument. But then you've got to the point where at a certain point you take the commodity to market. The value is supposed to be in motion, but all you've got is a bunch of widgets on the factory floor. There's no motion there and you can't take it out. You just, you, the only thing you can do is to take your widgets to market and try and make sure you can sell it. So you sell it. And you hope that you can sell it at a price where that gives you profit and which is equivalent to actually realizing the surplus value. Now, Marx calls this part of the story, realization of value. And the language he uses about the production process, because it's not simply about production, because production is always meant in this double sense, material and social, he calls it valorization. That is, the implantation of value within the commodity. So, the first step then is valorization. Second step is the realization of the value in the market. But the realization of the value in the market depends upon there being an effective demand for the commodity. And the effective demand has two components. One is that there has to be wants, needs and desires for those commodities. Because if nobody wants, needs or desires a particular commodity, nobody's going to buy it. 
it has no value. So Marx says, value is contingent on there being wants, needs and desires for the commodity. Value is also con contingent on not only do people have the wants, needs and desires, they have to have the money to pay for it. So it's wants, needs and desires backed by ability to pay, which forms the effective demand. So then the question is, where is that effective demand coming from? And we can't really answer that at this point, because we now need to take a look at what happens to all of that money which is realized as value. Well, the money that's realized as value is then distributed. And it goes off into this sphere of distribution. And the distribution is, well, partly it goes to wages. You pay the workers. Well, the workers then exercise uh, an effective demand because they come back in to buy the wage goods, which then you know, reproduce them as laborers. So that's part of it. But then the surplus value is also received by a large number, divided between a large number of agents and institutions. Taxes, for example, come into play. Now, Marx never actually wrote about taxes. Now, this is very peculiar, because he should have done. Uh, except when you understand something about what Marx did and when he did it, Marx never wrote about things that he didn't know a tremendous amount about. And we know from the Grundrisse that he was going to write a book about the state and civil society. And he never got round to it anywhere, so since the state and civil society are supported by taxes and tithes and all these kinds of things, he didn't write about it. So well, I don't know anything about it, so I'm not writing about it. I'm leaving it till much later. So that's one way part of the surplus and part of the value gets redistributed amongst them. Then it gets distributed amongst at, at, at various groups of, of people. Uh, the direct producers, those who are producing the surplus value, get some of it, but actually they ended up, end up getting what's left over after they've paid off certain others. That is, they have to pay off the landlord, pay off rent. They have to pay the merchant, so there's profit on merchant capital. Uh, they have to pay the banks and financiers, so there's, prop, uh, there's, there's interest they need to pay. So, they pay, so the, the, the value and surplus value then gets divided up amongst all of these factions. And then part of that division dividing up comes back in the form of effective demand. I've already mentioned, you know, workers get wages and they come back as effective demand. Segments of the bourgeoisie come back as effective demand, bourgeois, and of course the state with its expenditures comes back with effective demand. So we get a sort of a feedback, a loop if you like, which is taking the distributed value and recycling it back in as effective demand. But at some point or other also some of that money has to be extracted again from this great seething pool of distributed value in money form and pushed back in to form money capital and go back into the circulation process. So this is the circulation kind of process that Marx uh, is describing. And it then seems to me that what we need to do is to look more closely at what happens as it you, as capital goes through these different moments of metamorphosis, as it goes through the process of realization, is the point of realization a point where you could possibly see crises forming? Well, obviously, there's not the effective demand there. Uh, and if there's no wants, needs, and desires, you're going to get a lot of value, which is potentially value created in production, which goes nowhere. That is, you throw it away, it becomes waste. Uh, you, you know, so <coughs> crises can form because there's an effective demand problem. The distribution moment also has so many uh, forms, and can the money get back into being valorized again 
or will it just churn around amongst distributive agents in which banks lend to landlords who then put their money in the banks and banks lend to other banks and you know is there is there some danger of uh, the value being lost in all that churning that goes on in the field of distribution. So this is the general framework that Mark sets up. And in the diagram, what I do is to suggest that there are actually also some elements from outside. I mentioned the free gifts of nature. That uh, if you can extract things from nature for nothing, you will. And in the early stages of capitalism, then you extracted a great deal of free goods from, from, from nature. The same is true of human nature. That is, the powers and capacities of the laborer are not uh, actually powers and capacities uh, which uh, are, are simply trained, as it were, by capital. They are there. Uh, because of cultural configurations and, you know, the whole history of human societies and things like that. And so capital actually uh, takes those as free gifts. It says, I can use the talents and capacities and powers of the laborer for those ten hours I have them, uh, and, 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 and a lot of that is a free gift of, of human nature. So there are these free elements within the system which are I think uh, terribly, terribly important. So that is, if you like, the whole kind of circulation process as Marx sets it up. Now, how does Marx set about analyzing this? And this is, I think, the main interesting point and the thing you have to realize whenever you're reading Capital. You say, what are the three volumes of Capital doing? Well, actually, Marx lays out what his whole kind of thing is in the following. Uh, he says, in the first volume of Capital, he says this. The first condition of accumulation is that the capitalist must have contrived to sell the commodities and to reconvert into capital the greater part of the money received from their sale. In the following pages, that is, of volume one of Capital, we shall assume that capital passes through its process of circulation in the normal way. The detailed analysis of this process will be found in Volume 2, not in Volume 1. The capitalist who produces surplus value is by no means its ultimate proprietor. He has to share it afterwards with capitalists who fulfill other functions in social reproduction taken as a whole, with the owner of land and with yet other people. Surplus value is therefore split up into various parts. Its fragments fall to various categories of person and take on various mutually independent forms such as profit, interest, gains made through trade, ground rent, etc. We shall be able to deal with these modified forms of surplus value only in Volume 3. On the one hand, then, we assume here, that is in Volume 1, that the capitalist sells the commodities he has produced at their value i.e. there's no problem at all of the realization of, of, the, of, the, of the value. On the other hand, we treat the capitalist producer as the owner of the entire surplus value, or perhaps better, as a representative of all those who will share the booty with him. What this means is that Volume 1 confines its attention to that passage from money up until the point of realization. On this diagram, it's the left-hand side of the diagram. It just confines itself to that and then says, there's no problem about realization. Distribution doesn't concern me. It is of no interest to me. And we just assume all, everything else that goes on everywhere else goes on in, quote, a normal way, that is, a way which is completely untroubled by any difficulties whatsoever. So volume one, is solely concerned with the passage from money up until the realization, and it is assumed that the realization occurs because everything is going to be sold at its value. Now, what Marx is doing here is abstracting from the 
the total circulation process of capital and putting it under the microscope in volume one. And what does he see? What he sees is that valorize, the moment of valorization occurring in the labor process is the moment of congealing value and surplus value in the commodity. That all of this is occurring under the assumption of a perfectly competitive economic system. Now here too we have to ask some questions about assumptions. Marx actually assumes a perfectly competitive capitalist system. That is, he assumes Adam Smith was right to formulate his understanding of the economy in the way he did. Now this is very strange because you think, well, you know, you really wanted to see Marx kind of departing from Adam Smith, not saying, I accept the hidden hand of the market. That's what he does in chapter 2 of volume 1. I accept the hidden hand of the market. Of course, what he's going to do is to say that the hidden hand is the hand of the laborer. That's what he does further down the line. Now, the interesting thing about this is that whenever you ask any kind of conventional economist, what do they think of Marx's labor theory of value? They say, well, it's just a mystical kind of thing, you know, it just happens, uh, you know, nobody can take that seriously. And then you say to them, well, what about the hidden hand? Isn't that mystical thing? And they go, well, no, that's the market. I mean, no, that's the market. You know, I mean, no, no, that's the way the market is. And you say, I don't see it. Well, why should I take a market as being a hidden hand? And you have a little argument of that kind. And it actually turns out, of course, the hidden hand is just as mystical as Marx's theory of value. In fact, if not more so, because, you know, Adam Smith does not say whose hidden hand it is. Whereas Marx is definitely in there saying, well, it's the hidden hand of labor that you've got to be looking at here. And the fact that Adam Smith ignored what was happening to laborers, for the most part, is part of the, the critique that he will offer. But Marx is still accepting the notion of perfectly functioning markets. He doesn't say why, but my own view is simply this. That what Marx was actually out to do in Volume 1 of Capital in particular was to deconstruct the utopian vision of free market capitalism that the classical political economists were trying to, 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 to promote. In other words, he's saying, all right, let's assume you have, you're granted all of your assumptions of a perfectly functioning market then what is actually going to happen? And of course what happens is that you degrade nature and you get greater and greater levels of inequality. So Marx in volume one of Capital sets out to show why capital is technologically dynamic, why in a competitive society technologies are perpetually changing, and why there's this tremendous dynamic, why absolute surplus value, that is extending the length of the working day beyond that needed to reproduce the value of the labor power, is then supplemented by reducing the value of labor power by technological innovations that make wage goods cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And here too you get an accounting which goes on in the value schema of things which is different from what may happen materially. For example, when technological innovation comes in, then the value of the items being produced, individual items, diminishes. And as items become cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, if those items are important in determining the value of labor power, then you can reduce the value of labor power even though people are getting the same number of items. In other words, the material standard of living of labor can remain constant, while the actual share of value is going down and down and down and down through technological innovation. And this is one of the reasons technological innovation is so favored. In fact, you can even get a situation where 
the material standard of living of, of the labourer can increase at the same time as their share in value production is going down. And that, of course, is what a Walmart economy is about, and that's what's been going on for the last 30, 40 years. The share of labour in total output has gone down and down and down, but the material basis of daily life has actually improved. So everybody has cell phones now, which they didn't have you know, 30 years ago. So these, again, whether you're making the accounting in value terms or material terms, keep that always in mind. Because when somebody comes along and says, oh, well, what Marx predicts is kind of the laborers are going to be worse off, and look, they've got cell phones and they've got all these kinds of things, you say, no. Marx wasn't saying they would be materially worse off. They might be. But they could, in fact, be materially better off, but their share of the value is going down and down and down. So what Marx does then is to set up a model, if you like, of what happens in that valorization process. And the model comes to a certain conclusion as to what the consequences would be if the assumptions of that model are, cor model are correct. Those are some, and those are all, and then what will happen is the rich will get richer and the poor will get poorer. Nature will get de degraded. And she has that wonderful kind of passage, I can read you a bit of it in here, when he talks about, uh, uh, he talks about, within the capitalist system, all methods for raising the social productivity of labor are put into effect at the cost of the individual worker. All means of the development of production undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become means of domination and exploitation of the producers. They distort the worker into a fragment of a man. They degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine. They destroy the actual content of his labor by turning it into torment. They alienate from him the intellectual potentialities of the labor process in the same proportion as science is incorporated in it as an independent power. They deform the conditions under which he works, subject him during the labor process to a despotism more hateful for its meanness. They transform his lifetime into working time and drag his wife and child beneath the wheels of the juggernaut of capital. But all methods for the production of surplus value are at the same time methods of accumulation. And every extension of accumulation becomes, conversely, a means for the development of these methods. It follows, therefore, that in proportion as capital accumulates, the situation of the worker, be his payment high or low, must grow worse. Finally, the law which always holds the relative surplus population or industrial reserve army in equilibrium with the extent and energy of accumulation rivets the worker to capital more firmly and the wedges of Hephaestus held Prometheus to the rock. It makes the accumulation of misery a necessary condition, corresponding to the accumulation of wealth. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is, therefore, at the same time, accumulation of misery, the torment of labor, slavery, ignorance, brutalization and moral degradation at the opposite pole, i.e. on the side of the class that produces its own product as capital. That's conclusion, volume one. Now my point about this is Two points I would make about it. First, there's no question whatsoever that this process that Marx is talking about here is something which recurs again and again within the history of capitalism. You can see it, of course, in the early 19th century factories of Manchester. You'll see it right now in Shenzhen. You'll see it in Bang you know, Bangladesh. You'll, you'll see it everywhere. So it's obviously the case that there's a certain truth to what Marx is talking about. But at the same time, there's a lot of evidence that, that this is not the whole story. And people are quite correct when they say, well, it's not all doom and gloom for, for, for the workers. Actually, if you look at something like life expectancy, many parts of the world, life expectancy is far, far higher now than, of course, it was in the 19th century. And that applies to the working class as well, even though workers are, have a far lower life expectancy than, uh, you know, we academics and priests and judges and people like that. So, so something else is going on. And the something else that's going on comes from the fact that if you drop Marx's assumptions that everything's okay with realization, if you drop the assumptions that nothing matters in the distribution, 
then maybe you would construct a different story. So volume one of Capital then just works on that part of the story, and it works on it as if there is no problem elsewhere. Volume two of Capital works, as he says he's going to do, works on realization. Actually, there's a lot in volume two which is about effective demand. And what happens with effective demand? And, and of course, one of the difficulties of talking about this from Marxist circles, as soon as you say that, people start to say to you, oh, you're, you're, you're Keynesian, <laughs> you're not Marxist. And I said, no, no, actually, you know, Marx came up with this before Keynes, and if anything, Keynes was a little bit of a Marxist in that he followed volume two uh, and was influenced secretly by volume two of Capital. <laughs> uh, he, and he was, actually. He never read him himself, but he had other, he had other people, you know, like, you know, it's like when you get graduate students to read all the nasty stuff you don't want to read and, then, <laughs> and they tell you what, so he, Keynes had people like that around who told him what was in volume two and, oh yeah, okay. So this is a, so, so the question of realization then becomes absolutely, absolutely critical. And volume two does a, a number of things. One is, Marx starts to talk in volume two about the whole circulation process and says, well, let's look at this whole circulation process from the standpoint of what happens at the money point, what happens at the commodity point, what happens at the production point. In other words, Marx says, let's disaggregate this whole circulation process and look at it from the standpoint of money, commodity, and production. And what do we see? We see actually that there are different things which may be going on depending upon where you start. If you simply hold money and you're only interested in increasing your money, then you wouldn't necessarily be, want to be bothered yourself with production. You'd lend it to somebody else. Let them do the production and they can pay me interest or something like that. As long as I get my surplus at the end of the day, my distributive share, I'll, I'll do that. So the, through the standpoint of money, the whole kind of what you have to go through in production is an inconvenience. It's an inconvenience between money and money plus profit. And it's a nuisance and let somebody else deal with that. The direct producer, on the other hand, says realization is a problem and also getting the money back is a problem. And, and of course, the merchant capitalist, as it were, who holds the commodity, says everything is a problem around it, apart from my bit, you know, and I just want the producer to give me the stuff so I can sell it and, 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 and all the rest of it. So there are three different perspectives, but what you then, you know, Marx says, well, you know, in, in, a, in a, a real situation, a, a, a proper capitalist entrepreneur would actually be combining those three different roles. And Marx always talks about roles rather than persons. And he said, the capitalist industrial, as he calls, it's unfortunate he uses the word industrial, but the capitalist producer really has to be a good money manager, a good producer, and a good merchant. Now we all have known of examples where people are brilliant as producers, but they don't, they can't figure out the money side of things and they go bankrupt. Or they can't figure out the merchant side of things and go bankrupt. Now, this, of course, is going to be the foundation for, for, for explaining why it is that capital breaks up into factions like, okay, there's a producer who just passes on to the merchant and let them take care of the merchanting, and somebody else, like, you know, the banks and so on, assemble all the money and give you the money, and so they're the ones who, who, who do the money, money side of things. But also it turns out, of course, that, that, that value in those different states has different uh, material possibilities. The one I always want to look at, and it's very important, is geographical mobility. The most mobile form of capital is of course money. It's what I call the butterfly form of capital. It can flit around and land anywhere and flit <coughs> off again. Commodity is less mobile than money, but still, depending upon the nature of the commodity, is variably mobile. Production is the least mobile. So if we're going to talk about globalization, which form of capital would you want to put at the top of the pile? Well, obviously, 
Money. Finance. Okay. Who liberated finance capital um, and what did it do in the 1970s? And why did finance capital become hegemonic? And, you know, I mean, in other words, there's a whole set of questions there that you can immediately approach, actually just by sort of looking at, thinking about those three different roles and the capacities and powers and possibilities that exist in those three different roles. So Marx looks at that, but then he kind of says, well, actually, I've got to start looking at the effective demand. Where is it coming from? How does, how does capital circulate? And volume two is very much concerned with something else, which is how fast do you go around the circulation process? It's a really great analysis of speed up. Why is the capitalist so interested in speed up? Because, you know, if you're going around this process and it takes you three years to get around it, you get one bout of profit coming out of it. If you can get around it in three minutes, you know, obviously, the faster you move, the more you can get. And if I'm in competition with you, I and I go faster than you, I, you know. So speed up has been an absolute crucial element in what is going on in the history of capitalism. And actually, if you start to look at technological innovation and ask how many technological innovations are about speed up? And what are the consequences <coughs> of speed up? Well, Marx doesn't actually think these through too well. For example, one of the consequences of speed up in production is there's got to be speed up in consumption. That is, you've got to start manipulating wants, needs and desires, and this is where the madmen of advertising come in and all that sort of stuff. And fashion comes in and all these sorts of things. And planned obsolescence comes in. Uh, and capital starts to make things that fall apart after three years or become out obsolescent after two years. So the whole thing shifts towards a kind of a consumer world which is actually speeding up as well. In other words, the, the phenomenon of speed up in our society, again, in, in, in my lifetime, has been absolutely incredible. I mean, you know, I, I came from an academic culture where if you produce two books in a lifetime, you were considered a bit, you know, too ambitious. <laughs> now, of course, if you, if you haven't produced a book every two years, people think you died, so <laughs> you, you kind of, you know. So, so anyway, the, the turnover time of everything, okay? Just, just, just crazy. And it's part of the insanity of the world right now. I mean, it's got to a point of acceleration. And of course, what you're seeing in through all of these kinds of artificial intelligence and all these things and what's going on in stock markets and nanosecond and microsecond trading and all this sort of thing is, 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 is kind of speed up, speed up, speed up, speed up. Well, that, the logic of that is all actually sort of set out in volume two of Capital. I mean, Marx obviously wasn't going to predict all of these sorts of things, but it's pretty clear that the question of speed up uh, is, uh, and turnover time is crucial. And it's not only the turnover time uh, of bit, how long it's in the market, but the production time, how long does it take you to produce something. Uh, you start to interfere in all sorts of things so that uh, uh, hogs that used to have litters once a year now have them three times a year. Uh, they've even managed to engineer lobsters so they get bigger, faster than, you know, I mean, every, yeah, everything's about, and, you know, and all that salmon you think is organic, it's actually sort of speeded up, you know. So, 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 so there's, a, there's, there, there's a whole world going on here that Marx is, is getting with and kind of saying, well, that also is, is putting certain pressures on effective demand and how effective demand is expressed. And the money has to flow faster uh, as well. And how do, how do you then get technologies of money so we get that 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 have very low transaction costs, which which move very fast, and so you get electronic monies suddenly. And then the question arises, like I started out by saying, what's the relationship between these new forms of electronic monies that are for, uh, occurring all over the place and value? All right? Isn't it possible that they're so out of you know control, as it were, in relationship to value production that they're going off in this direction, and then nobody knows what it's all about? because we've abandoned the material form of representation, which was gold and silver. We've ab abandoned the metallic base, and now we're adding just zeros to the money supply as 
uh, Federal Reserve sort of uh, does quantitative easing or something of that kind. So these sorts of issues are, are very much set up in volume, volume two of Capital. But then there's something weird about volume two of capital. Marx, in order to study this process of realization, assumes there is no technological change. The whole of volume two rules out any discussion of technological change. Well, technological change is the foundation of volume one. Mm -hmm. You say, well, how, how, okay. So he says, now I, I, I assume that's all, there's no technological, zero technological change. And I also assume something else. In the same way in volume one he assumed that everything exchanges at its value, in volume two he also says, I assume everything exchanges at its value. But that assumption has a different purpose in volume two. He in effect says, I assume that demand and supply are in equilibrium. I assume that the value produced is equivalent to the effective demand. I make that assumption. That is, I make the assumption that everything is in equilibrium. I then ask, what are the conditions under which such an equilibrium could be established? And I always work backwards from the equilibrium to say, what is it that could possibly give you that equilibrium? And he finds, actually, a macroeconomic situation in which things have to be calibrated very, very finely such that those things could be in equilibrium. And in fact, the only point at which technological change really comes into volume two is that he finds the only way it can, the equilibrium can be established is by a particular twist in technological mix. Now what this says you know, in macroeconomic terms is that there can be a macroeconomic growth path, which is stable and trouble-free, provided that there is a pattern of technological change of a very, very particular sort. Now Marx doesn't make the argument, but it's obvious to me that when you look at the technological change that would be required to keep everything in equilibrium, and you look at the crazy forces of technological change, which are let loose in volume one of Capital, and which are described in the Communist Manifesto and all the rest of it, there's absolutely no way in hell you can ever be in equilibrium. You never can get to that equilibrium path. So there are inevitably what we now call crises of disproportionality. That is, the whole thing is going to get very much out of equilibrium. The only way to bring it back into equilibrium is to have a crisis. And so Marx starts to say, Okay, the role of crisis is because you've got outside of equilibrium and it re-establishes equilibrium by doing what? Destroying capital. You have to destroy bunches of capital here, there and everywhere in order to get yourself back. So crises of devaluation are part of the answer which comes out of volume two. The other thing is that he could only get to those, that understanding in a situation where there was no technological change. Because if he introduced technological change into it, it'd be, like for the reasons I've, I've already suggested, the whole thing goes haywire. The whole thing. But nevertheless, you can read volume two and say, all right, well, this is telling me something. It's telling me stuff about speed up. It's telling me stuff about turnover time. It's telling me all of these kinds of things about, you know, but it's not the whole story, any more than volume one was the whole story. It's a different story. And the analogy I often use about this is to say, well, you know, let's suppose we're, we're looking in on a square and you're over there and I'm over here and I describe what I see very objectively and you describe what you see very objectively. We have two completely different descriptions. Both of them are true, but they're from different standpoints. What Marx does in volume one is have a standpoint tell you what he sees. He has a standpoint for volume two. He also tells you what he sees. The trouble is that volume two was never completed. So he, there's a lot of things there, that are all sorts of, you know, hanging out and you're not quite sure what to make of them. And it becomes difficult, but the standpoint is very clear. And he says that is going to be his standpoint in this kind of commentary in, in volume 
uh, in volume one, that in volume two I'm going to deal with that problem. And, and to some degree, he does deal with that problem in volume two. Now, in volume three, he assumes no problem at all about what's going on in volume one, no problem at all about what's going on in volume two, and starts to isolate and look at you know, what's going on in volume three. That is, let's look at distribution. But again, he looks at distribution in a very peculiar way. Instead of kind of saying, well, okay, uh, you know, all these distributions, he, he asks just one very simple elementary question. We know that before capital started to circulate as industrial capital in the way that I'm describing here, before that happened, there were landowners and landlords and there was a form of landed property which was claiming a lot of whatever surplus was being produced. We also know that there were bankers and financiers, and we also know there were merchant capitalists who were raging around the world and buying cheap and selling dear. So those are what he calls the antidiluvian forms of capital that existed before industrial capital became significant. Now, what Marx does not want to do is to say, you know, to the degree that in this advanced capitalist society, rent, interest, profit on merchants' capital are still important, to the degree that's true, we have to show why industrial capitalists who are making the value and the surplus value tolerate such factions. We have to therefore explain what the logic is of having financiers and bankers, landlords and merchant capitalists taking a part of the value and the surplus value. And what part should they take? So that's the question he seeks to answer, ask. Now this actually is a very interesting exercise. It's a theoretical exercise. And again it comes back to he wants to ask the question, what does a perfect, perfectly functioning capitalist society look like? In a perfectly functioning capitalist society, landlords would only take that part in rent which is really due to what their function is. Merchant capitalists would only take that part of what which deals with their function, and bankers likewise. So that's his, that's his argument, and that's his, his thrust. Now this is very different, of course, from what a real-life capitalist society would look like. That is, Marx does not consider what would happen if the financial system became so big that you had all these institutions which are essentially oligopolistic and which are too big to fail and all the rest of it and that therefore can wield power over everything that's going on around them. He doesn't consider that. What he does is something much more modest. And I think it's a worthwhile exercise to go through because you get away from a tendency which exists on the left, which is to regard all of those other factions as parasites. Totally useless parasites. Marx says no. No, there's a reason why land rent of a certain sort is important. There's a reason why the role of the banker is significant and important. And there's a reason why merchant capitalists are important. Just to take the merchant capitalists. Marx's argument about them was, <coughs> you know, individual capitalists have difficulty marketing their particular product. You know, uh, wouldn't it be better if a range of different products were all put together in one place and you had a kind of a market, you know, the merchant capitalist, and you had a, a department store or a supermarket or something of that kind, so that everybody who's shopping can go and just go and they can get all of the different things there instead of going to the supplier here, supplier there, supplier elsewhere. In a complicated society, you need the merchant capitalist to come in. So Marx says, and the merchant capitalist also shortens the turnover time for the industrial capitalist, because the industrial capitalist, instead of waiting there till they've sold their product, can pass it on to the merchant capitalist and says, well, okay, give me, enough, give me money. But they pass it on at a discounted rate. 
That is, the total value of the product is only realized by the merchant. But the merchant first pays off the, the producer a proportion uh, of the value. So they split the two and, you know, like I said, you know, there are people who know very good at making things but are not very good at the marketing stuff. Well, you've got specialist market people out there now who are specialized in selling stuff and getting it to move faster and through by influencing taste and fashion and all those kinds of things, specialized in manipulating the market in all kinds of ways. So the role of the merchant capitalist is, is absolutely critical for the proper functioning of uh, an advanced capitalist society. And I think that's again, I think, a significant finding on Marx's point. He does the same thing with landlords and he does the same thing uh, with uh, bankers and financiers. So this is, a, I think, a reasonable kind of exercise. But again, what I would want to say to you is this, that when you're reading Capital, you always have to be careful to know which volume you're in and what is being assumed and what is not. Because otherwise, somebody will read you what I read to you and then say, that's the truth that Marx, is it, you know, we stand or fall by whether this is the case. Well, here is what he said in volume two which doesn't have a clear conclusion as Volume 1 has, but there are elements of it, and one of the elements is this. And you'll see it, how different it is from what I read to you just now about Volume 1. Contradiction in the capitalist mode of production. The workers are important for the market as buyers of commodities. But as sellers of their commodity, labour power, capitalist society has the tendency to restrict them to their minimum price. Further contradiction. The periods in which capitalist production exerts all its forces regularly show themselves to be periods of overproduction, because the limit to the application of the productive powers is not simply the production of value, but also its realization. However, the sale of commodities, the realization of commodity capital, and thus of surplus value as well, is restricted, not by the consumer needs of society in general, but by the consumer needs of a society in which the great majority are always poor and must always remain poor. That is, if you follow the volume one prescription, and that's the way capital worked, you would end up with a very, very weak effective demand, and capitalists would have a lot of difficulty selling their product. So there's going to be pressures to try to raise wage rates to try to increase them. This is what Henry Ford did when he said, OK, we need to actually you know, have a working class that has enough money to buy the products that we make. So we go for a $5 eight hour a day. And, you know, and that, of course, is part of the logic of why Keynes would kind of say, well, one of the ways in which you start to actually do things is to, is to play around uh, with the effective demand. Now this then leads to maybe two or three very important features. The first point is this, that Marx often talked about his desire to create a model of capitalist society which was modeling it as, quote, a totality. What that would require would, of course, be putting all of these three volumes of capital together. Volumes 1, 2, and 3, even in their incomplete forms. Marx never tried to do that. He never got to the point where he felt he understood the stuff in Volume 2 well enough, or the stuff in Volume 3 well enough, to be able to kind of say, all right, now let's look at the totality. But I want to argue to you that in reading Marx's Capital, you've always got to have this idea of the totality in mind, and ask yourself the question, what is it that you're reading in Volume 3? Where does it lie in relationship to this totality? That is, having the visualization of what the totality of the circulation process is about is extremely helpful to helping you read and understand what it is you're reading and what it is you're not reading and why you should not draw certain inferences from what you're reading on the basis of, you know, its positionality. In, in, the, in, the, in the totality. So, so having some idea of the totality, and that's what I'm trying to do with this, is to create 
a version of the totality of the circulation process. <coughs> the second point is to ask, where's the driving force in this? In the hydrological cycle, the driving force is the input of energy from the sun. What's, well, we've seen one of the driving forces. One of the driving forces is the fact, as we've mentioned, that nobody in their right mind, starting off with a certain amount of money, would end up going through all this business just to end up with the same amount of money. Therefore, profit-seeking is a terribly important driving force. But, does that mean that effective demand is not a driving force? Wants, needs and desires are not a driving force. Now you can either say wants, needs and desires are simply creations of capital, which to a large degree they are, or you can kind of say wants, needs and desires in society have a very complex history and they actually put their own pressures on what it is that shall be a, an acceptable commodity. And why is it that we take certain commodities and say, we don't want this to be even in the value theory, in the value system at all? Why would we take a, something like education and say, take it out? Don't have it as part of the value. That is, do something, you know, provide it free good. Why don't we do that? You know. So why, so, so there's a lot of consumer choice involved here and the moment of realization is a, an intense moment of political activism which parallels the activism that goes on in the valorization process. Now Marxists are very fond of talking about the activism that attaches to the valorization process, work, class struggle in the workplace, this kind of thing. They're not so happy talking about action, political action, around the question of realization. When in fact, the question of realization is very, very important because a lot of values is actually extracted at the point of, of realization. I'll give you an example, you know, which you've all heard about. Hedge funds take over a pharmaceutical company, raise the price of the drug from $15 a pill to $750 a pill. I mean, this is something that's happening at the moment of realization and it's, and, and it's not as if, you know, there's been any big changes in the production system or anything like that. This is simply a gimmick that's used. Look what's happened in housing. All the hedge funds go up, go in and buy up uh, foreclosed housing and start to, so, you know, then sort of rent it out, at, uh, you know. And actually the politics that goes on at the point of realization is a very critical politics and a lot of it of course concur, concerns daily life in the city which is one of the reasons why I'm always talking about the politics of realization as being foundational for looking at the nature of social struggles going on in cities. Struggles over housing, health care, you know, against price gouging, against the telephone companies, you know, I mean everything, you know. Well this is all the politics of realization. The reason Marxists don't like it is because at the point of realization, the worker no longer is a worker. At the point of realization, Marx is very clear, the worker is simply a buyer. And at the point of realization, it's a relations between buyers and sellers. And since it's not about class and capitalist class and working class, Marxists say, no, 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 it's not, not, that's not where the real action is. But of course, if you take the totality, and this is the point about it, if you take the totality, then that is indeed one of the points where there is a huge amount of social struggle going on. And that huge amount of social struggle is very much about the embeddedness of what is happening at that point in this total circulation process. And that therefore an anti-capitalist struggle has to locate its struggles not only at the point of production and the point of valorization, it has to locate also at the point of realization and recognize that. The, sec the third point I would make is this, that with respect to distribution, I said, you know, Marx actually worked things out of saying, what's the logic of having these people around in a society dominated by a industrial capitalists. And he came up with very good answers. But on that basis, we also have to recognize that those groups form power blocks, which actually exercise immense power. And in fact, 
the situation arises where the merchant capitalists that Marx assumed only took the discounted value of the surplus value, the merchant capitalists are actually realizing much more of the surplus value now than the direct producers. Walmart doesn't produce much value, it markets it, but it takes an enormous amount of value. And the value is produced in workshops in China and all that kind of thing, so it's produced elsewhere and it's realized somewhere else. Apple, these computers, made in Shenzhen, and Shenzhen has about a 3% rate of profit, Apple has a 28% rate of profit. That is, the merchant capitalists are taking a lot. And then you look at the finance capitalists, and then you look at the rentiers and all this kind of stuff, and you kind of say, my God, they're taking the whole damn lot. And in fact, the direct producers are not doing much, not getting much at all. So we've got to be prepared not to sort of sit there with Marx's definition. I think it was a useful exercise to explain why these people are there, why you can't get rid of them, why you can't nationalize them out of existence or something like that. But it's very difficult to then sort of assume that they're just going to sit there and take what they're supposed to take in a perfectly functioning economy. But you can see immediately that an economy can get extremely lopsided in the realm of distribution that actually bankers look and say, well, okay, we have money, where are we going to invest it? Are we going to invest it in production? Or are we going to invest it in uh, those people over there who are uh, engaging in land speculation? <coughs> oh, the rate of return on land speculation is much higher than it is in production. Let's put it in land speculation. In other words, there's a lot of unproductive investment going on. And so again, there are all these sorts of issues which I think are significant. And finally, I'd like to make this point about it. You, know, you can ask me what is the, what is, what's, what's the value of, of having something like this? What's the political value of it? Well, it just helps you locate a little bit some ideas and proposals that are around you. For example, Bernie Sanders' campaign uh, argued for a $15 uh, minimum wage. Uh, more recently, Black Lives Matter has argued for basic uh, income. Uh, initially uh, oriented to uh, black communities, but it's been very hard to imagine it without it becoming actually universal. What does this do? Put it in this map. Say, look, where does this sit? This is like increasing the effective demand. And the theory of it is, if people have more money because of higher minimum wage, if people have more money because they've got a basic income, then they can re improve their conditions of reproduction of labor power. That is, you can get it round the back down to this corner of the reproduction of labor power. They can improve their lives substantially because they will have that extra effective demand. Now that assumes that nobody's going to rip them off at the point of realization. Okay. Who else is in favor of a basic income? Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley knows that its innovations are going to put everybody out of work. They also know if everybody's out of work, they're not going to have any money and they're not going to buy what, they, what they're selling. So Silicon Valley is also very interested in a basic income. Now that doesn't mean I'm against basic income, I'm kind of mildly in favour, but my point is this, that actually unless you get hold of the politics of realisation, the basic income, raising the minimum wage and all this kind of stuff, is not going to give, get you anywhere in terms of actually getting down to improving the conditions of the reproduction of the population. It's not going to get there because you're going to be ripped off en route. And you might ask politically, is it better to actually sort of say, all right, we want, to, we want to have legislation which strictly forbids any hedge fund from doing anything and taking over any pharmaceutical company and this kind of stuff. Are you going to do something like that? Take all of that out. Take, you know, are we going to do the same about you know, foreclosed housing being bought up by, you know, you know? Are, are, there, are there things we can do somewhere else? Other, but my, my point here is that having a map of this kind and then thinking about how you insert 
you know, what to do here, there and everywhere in it, you kind of say, all right, well, there are things that can be said here, important things that can be said. So I think this is uh, politically useful. Again, not in the sense that somehow or other you plug it in and you get out of answers, but it helps you to sort of think through what is going on in terms of the circulation of capital in general. And it's very important that we resurrect the notion of the totality and understand, and that's why I want to stick with this, it's a, it's a total framework of this circulation which is important. Now, you can start to add things in. In terms of the drivers, I said, okay, effective demand can be a driver. Another big driver is actually the fact that banks end up with a lot of money. And they actually create money. So when you go to the distribution thing, there is another driver. And Marx actually, when he gets to the banks, starts saying, they're the ones who are really pushing accumulation. They've got money and they want to make more money and therefore they go charging down this kind of thing of reinvestment, trying to push as much as they can. And the banks, in pushing as much as they can to valorization, suddenly realize they've got to fund realization. So you can put a link through here which connects, you know, the banks and the financiers and interest to both valorization and realization. Because that's what goes on in housing markets. Financiers, they finance the developer to build housing. And the same financiers sometimes buy, finance consumers to buy that housing. I mean, this is a perfect circle, which is of course a perfect situation for asset, you know, bubbles and, and, and the like. So, so there's a driver there, but where is it driving everything to? And, and, and what about? So you could, by thinking through this and sort of just looking at it, and kind of playing around and adding things to it, and then, uh, taking things away and, and all the rest of it, and, is you can start to actually imagine thinking through a whole set of, of very interesting relationships. But it's in the context of the totality, and I think that's the point I'm trying to, to make, that Marx, when he's talking about the totality, is talking about something very powerful and very significant. He never, unfortunately, went along to try to demonstrate what it looked like. What I'm trying to do is distill out of, you know, my reading of three volumes of Capital and theories of surplus value and all the rest of it and Grundrisse, some kind of general framework that is, I think, consistent with what he was talking about, then use it to try to explain what he was talking about where, why volume one is only dealing with this and volume two with that, and why they're so, you know, contradictory to, to each other in terms of the sorts of conclusions <coughs> they're, they're posturing. So this is, if you like, the way I would want to see us approach the text and texts of Marx's capital, that having the broad sense, having an intuition, if you like, of what, of what this is all about and what Marx is trying to do, I just think is profoundly helpful. Because with Marx there's always a woods for the trees kind of problem. But by having something like this clearly in mind, I think it's just helpful to, to, to push it to the level where you can understand not only things going on around us, but also, you know, what the intellectual history is of these kinds of formulations that Marx set out. And one of the things that can be done, I think, is to raise the question, how well have Marxists actually represented much of this totality? There is a tendency within Marxism and within those who articulate Marxism to favour volume one, because it's a beautiful book. But the totality is something else. There's a tendency to think that distribution is just distribution, and that's the end of the story. Actually, it's not. It's the end of the story, but it's also the beginning of another story. And by actually seeing what happens, and this is what I want to talk about in future lectures, because 
There are many other aspects of this which I'm, you know, I haven't got to yet, but which are really, I think, important uh, for trying to understand not only Marx, but understand the nature of what capital is about, both the concept and the book. So let me leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs>